healthier bodies, greater empathy, lower rates of depression, longer lifespans. Doing just one thing will allow you to accrue all of these physical and emotional benefits. Not only will it improve your life, it will help your friends and their friends thrive too. You might be guessing the answer is exercise, or maybe meditation, or eight hours of sleep a night. All are good guesses, but they are not the answer. So what is the magic pill? It's generosity. Yes, generosity, the simple act of giving. In the book I co-authored on the topic, we cite study after study showing that generous people are physically healthier, have greater empathy, suffer from lower rates of depression, and even live longer than those who don't practice generosity. The happiness chemicals oxytocin and dopamine are released when we give. One expert says that on a scale from one to 10, where 10 is a really powerful drug like insulin, generosity rates a seven or eight. And it doesn't matter how much or how little you have, whether you are rich or poor, whether you live in a developed or developing country, the studies show that giving to others improves our short-term happiness and our long-term well-being. The benefits of a generous life are demonstrable verifiable and authentic, and they are right within our grasp. But as we know, just because the research says something is good for us doesn't mean we do it. I'll be the first to admit that I didn't either. Like many of you, I did not come from privilege, and I worked hard to earn my education. Much of my youth was spent in a single-parent household, and by age 15, I was working 20 hours a week at a fast food restaurant. When I received a signing bonus for my first professional job after college, not once did it occur to me to give any of it away. The specter of student loans loomed large, and quite frankly, after a lifetime of frugality, I wanted to indulge myself a little bit in that first taste of financial success. Kathleen Vo is a behavioral scientist at the University of Minnesota, likely would have been able to predict what I was going to do with that money. She led a research team on conducting a study on the psych psychology of money, doing nine different experiments showing that the presence of money makes us act more self-sufficiently and, as a result, less generously. What's more is that that presence of money doesn't even have to be conscious for it to impact our behavior. In one experiment, participants were asked to complete a questionnaire at a desk on which sat a computer. At the six minute mark, the computer screen stayed blank for some people. For others, an image of fish swimming underwater appeared. And for still others, an image of money floating under the water appeared. After completing the questionnaire, participants were asked to set up two chairs, one for themselves and one for a new person for a get acquainted conversation. Without any discussion of money, or any mention of it on the questionnaire, the people who had been exposed to the screen saver with money proceeded to place their chairs farther apart by nearly a foot than those who had not been exposed to the idea of money. Eight other experiments showed the same result. Money makes us act and feel more independent. It's this independence, this self-sufficiency that stifles our generous natures. It helps explain why we aren't more generous, even when we know we could be reaping the physical and emotional benefits of giving. With my signing bonus, I was real-life evidence of the experimental result. I wasn't an antisocial hermit or a miser, but giving wasn't my first impulse. Later, once my student loans were paid, I began to donate more meaningfully Inconsistently, in a few years after that, I became the treasurer at my church and taught stewardship, so my giving became more intentional. But it wasn't until my first trip to Tanzania in 2008 that I understood radical generosity. The purpose of my trip was to meet the four-year-old girl we had started sponsoring a year prior. I thought that meeting her would be the highlight of the trip. And while she was darling and precious, it was her mother, Misaru, 
who captivated me. Nasara was about my age, yet her life story read entirely differently. She hadn't attended school. She, at the time of my visit, she had four children, one of whom had already made her a grandmother. And within a few months, she would be pregnant again with her fifth child. Daily, she walked miles to fetch water while farming the family's land and caring for the children who were still at home. I saw myself in this mother. You might wonder why, as I've already shared, how different her life story read from mine. But our stories started similarly. I was born in Saigon, Vietnam, during the Vietnam War. My mother is Vietnamese, and she was 19 years old when she met my father, an American stationed as a military contractor for the U.S. Air Force. No one knows exactly how many mixed-race children were left behind after the war. But we do know that after 1988, when Congress granted special immigration status to children born of Vietnamese mothers and American fathers, over 21,000 people relocated to the U.S. We'll never know how many more stayed, either by choice or by default. As I looked at Nasaru, I saw how easily my story could have been a carbon copy of hers. There was no logical reason why I wasn't farming a rice paddy in Vietnam. There wasn't no logical reason why I had had decades of schooling instead of a handful of years. There was no logical reason why I got to live in a brick house with four bedrooms instead of a mud hut with a thatch roof. In that moment, I was looking in a mirror and I realized I am no different from Nasaru. The only difference is that I was airlifted out of poverty and she wasn't. I had been given a gift, a gift I didn't earn or deserve, a gift I could never repay. But I could be grateful and I could do everything in my power to pay it forward. After that trip, generosity became more than an act of giving to me. It became a way of living. Instead of asking, what can I afford to give away? I started to ask, what do I really need to keep? That's the key question when it comes to radical generosity. What do we really need to keep? And when we shift to that question, we start to taste a freedom around money that belies the scarcity narrative we hear every day in our culture. Instead, we sense abundance. Writer Anne Lamott says that whenever she feels like she doesn't have enough, she gives some of it away. <laughs> Giving it away doesn't make her rich. It makes her life richer. It makes other people's lives richer, too. I mentioned that Nasaro became pregnant again shortly after my visit. She had another girl whom we then also sponsored. Her daughters have received the education she didn't, nominally because of my family's gifts, but really only because of the radically generous gift I'd been given nearly 50 years earlier of a new life and new home at age one. This ripple effect of generosity, it's been studied. And it goes beyond what you might expect, simple reciprocity as in, you held the door for me, I'll hold the next one for you. It extends much further. When it comes to giving, one act of kindness ripples out three degrees of separation. In other words, your kind act to someone today will cause that person to do something generous, which in turn will inspire a third and then an additional fourth act of kindness. Scientists call this phenomenon social contagion. And it's a movement we can all set in motion. You need not have been born in a war-torn country to understand or practice radical generosity. You only need to be grateful. And here on the North Shore of Chicago, we have plenty of reason to be grateful 
In fact, all across our country, we have reason to be grateful. Millions of Americans are one percenters on the world stage. It takes only $32,400 to put you in the top 1% of earners worldwide. Will you join me in a new club of one percenters? We'll call it the plus one percenters. Here's how. First, figure out how much you gave away to charity last year. Take that number and divide it by your total income. Multiply by 100, and you have the percent of your earnings that you donated. Now, the next step is vitally important, so please listen closely. Do not judge the number. Simply write it down. Now, add one. So if you gave 1% last year, aim for 2% this year. That's it. Radical generosity doesn't have to be dramatic, but it does need to be intentional. Plan ahead. Figure out how to adjust so that you can release another 1% of your income into the world. And small changes, they make big differences. Could you eat one fewer meal out a month and maybe go to the library for some of your books instead of purchasing them? At the end of a year, you'd have over $1,000, enough to buy 10 goats and 20 chickens for a family in need. 12 years ago, we started sponsoring Nasaru's daughter. Every year, we send an additional gift in honor of her birthday, usually around $100. In return, we receive a letter that details how they've spent the funds, accompanied by photos. The items in the photos have transformed with the, along with their prospects over the years. Early on, we'd see pictures of maize and occasionally a chicken. And then we started to see goats. And once the family finally felt food secure, they bought bed frames so they would no longer have to sleep on the floor. Later, we saw bricks and iron sheets as they began to build themselves a sturdier home. Last spring, the photo they sent took my breath away. Once again, we saw iron sheets. But this time, it wasn't in front of the family's home. It was in front of their daughter's school. The community had decided to replace the leaky thatch roof with waterproof iron so that the students could continue their studies even during the rainy season. Nasaru's family had contributed iron sheets and 20 bags of cement. They were giving money away. By our standards, this family has next to nothing. And yet they were sharing the precious resources they have. What are your iron sheets? What could you be releasing into the world with your radical generosity? Nasaru. She's a plus one percenter. Can you see yourself in her now? She has unleashed contagious generosity. I invite you to do the same. Thank you.